yourself, Ellen, and Richard, you're a power couple within the VO genre or medium, and I think that's fantastic. What made you both decide to stick with it for so long? We didn't decide. <laughs> I, I, think, I think it's kind of life that decides. I was starring in a Western, and uh, it was the end of the film, and the casting director came to me and said, would you like to do a film, do some voice work? And I said, sure, can I bring my boyfriend, or boyfriend along? So Richard and I both got the roles, and that was the beginning. And it was just kind of like a house of cards that kept falling. And we just kept doing it. We didn't decide to do voice work. Voice work decided for us. <laughs> So it wasn't a matter of um, you recommending him or him recommending you? Well, actually, I brought him in because I invited him. Oh, okay. <laughs> so his career is your fault. It is. <laughs> um, you do have a uh, storied career. Um, looking at your um, credits, it goes all the way back to I'm sorry, I've got a, a few chief officers I want me to bring up. Uh, Charlie's, Angel, uh, Charlie's Angels, yes. Chips, and Silver Spoons. Yes, yes, yes. Um, it goes back even farther than that. I did, uh, I did a pilot with Doris Roberts when I was a kid. Oh my God, And yeah. um, I don't remember the name of it. <laughs> I'm sure the owner will fill us in uh, later on. But, um, um, but, but anyhow, I started acting when I was 12, mm -hmm. and I started doing stage, and then I started doing film. And my first film was a film called Prisoner in the Middle, which is now called Warhead, that I did with David yes. Jansen. Yes. And from there, I went on to a Western called Jesse's Girls that I did with Rod Cameron and Sandra Curry. I mean, and then, and then what did I do? And then I did Duchess and the Dirt Water Fox that I filmed actually here in Denver. Well, and your husband's my, from here. Is that yes, Colorado? yes. But that was my first time in Denver when I filmed Duchess and the Dirt Water Fox with George and Goldie. It was one of those I brought to. Uh, I grew up on old films and, and Nick and I, like I said, and uh, Duchess and the Dirt, Dirt Water Fox, and I was like, oh my god, I don't remember her in that. I was the first Jewish bride in the West. <laughs> <laughs> and there was the bridal scene, and they were running uh, the, uh, I forget the name of the crew, and they were running, and they came into our wedding. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, they've, they've sliced a lot of it mm -hmm. <clears throat> for television, but <clears throat> um, wow. it, was, it was a lot of fun. That's great. It was a lot of fun. I don't know if it was the first Jewish like, wedding on, in a Western. <laughs> <laughs> How I got the role was really funny. Mel Frank uh, came to a wedding that I attended. And he saw me dancing, and he said, I want you in my film. So he wrote the part for me. Wow. Oh, wow. That's great. Oh, God, Mel Frank, I haven't thought of that name in a long time. Yeah, he was quite a character. Oh, uh, oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> Look him up, folks. Um. And also Mel Brooks. I, 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 I know Mel Brooks. I, I sat in Mel. I was. I did most of my work I, on twentieth, the twentieth century Fox lot, Charlie's Angels, Duchess. I mean, so many projects. Uh, my a, a pilot called Mr. and Mrs. Smith that I did yes. with. Um, uh, oh God, what's her name? Big star. She spread her legs and became. Oh, uh, <laughs> uh, 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 silver. Um. What's her name? 
She, there was a crotch shot and, and everybody in, in went fatal down. attraction, not fatal attraction. Yes. In uh, fatal, basic instinct. Basic was, instinct. Um, Sharon Stone. Sharon yes. Stone. Anyhow, Sharon and I did a pilot together and um, anyhow, I did a lot of stuff on twentieth. So anyhow, I was on the lot and I met Mel Brooks and he said, Come to watch uh, me direct and he was directing Young Frankenstein. Oh. So I sat with Gene Wilder, oh. and we spent the day together, Gene and I, and I sat next to him. To watch Mel Brooks direct the film, uh, Madeline Kahn was there, Terry Garr, Peter Boyle was on the table. Mm -hmm. um, uh, who else? Oh, Marty Feldman. Oh. Marty was so sweet. <clears throat> Anyhow, they were all there. Cloris Leachman, who oh, I later came to know as a friend. And one of the major rules as a director is do not give your actors line readings. Respect their talent enough that you direct them so that they can create their own. Mel didn't give line readings. Mel acted out the entire <laughs> part. He acted out the with roles the voices, I'm with sure. the voices and everything. He acted. I've heard it, that. It, it, yes. Frau Blucher. Uh, he acted out uh, Cloris's part. He acted out Jean's part. He acted out Peter Boyle. He said, "Pete, get off the table." And he got on the table and he's rising. <laughs> He acted out every single role in, that's the way Mel directed. And I turned to, I turned to Jean. Jean was so sweet, what a beautiful soul, what a beautiful man. And I turned to Jean and I said, the movie should be about Mel directing. <laughs> and he said yes, <laughs> and he laughed. I'm, you know, I, I, not the, I don't want to curse it. Um, but I'm sure when when Mel Brooks passes, I'm, there will be like a movie about him, <laughs> like Evan Lloyd, like the way like or Hitchcock, like eight and a half weeks. I mean, like the I have tons of Mel something. stories because he became a friend. But I, I mean, but to watch him direct, you couldn't believe it. It was like he was hanging from the chandeliers <laughs> doing everybody's <laughs> role. It was it. it the funniest thing you've ever seen. He didn't tell them what to do. He showed them what to do. And and Gene was such a gentleman when I said that. I said, you know, the movie should be about Mel direct, <laughs> directing this movie. And he laughed. He was such a gentleman. He had written the script with Mel, mm -hmm. young Frankenstein. Yes. <laughs> and he smiled and he laughed, but he was patient. He was never annoyed. He didn't say, why is he doing this? I'm an actor. I'm a trained actor. I know my craft. He didn't say anything. He sat there and was lovely. Well, I'm sure he would have known things. I think Blazing Saddles was a four mm -hmm. young friends. Yeah, yes. yeah. So, I mean, he would have known. I'm just walking. talking about his character. Mm -hmm. That That's the kind of person he was. Anyhow, that's my on-camera career continues. I, I wrote a sitcom. Richard and I are going to be starring in it. Oh, so wow. just, it's, it's, we're, we're about to shoot. So I'm um, just Congratulations. That sounds great. Thank you. Thank you. It's about two voice actors. No, it's oh. not. It's, but, but it I'm does, it I'm does right. borrow a little bit from, uh, I, I don't even want to say it. Okay. It's kind of a blend of curb your enthusiasm on the Incredibles. <laughs> I mean, I love I'm it. so in on that. Curb your, curb your enthusiasm with vigilantes. Your, <clears throat> I curb, think that sounds cool. Curb Your Incredibles. Just call it that. Curb Your, cur, well, it's got a name. I can't give oh, it to you okay. right now. Oh, okay. But anyhow. What's um, it called? I can't give it to okay, you. Okay, <laughs> So anyhow. Now, has your on-screen... <clears throat> How has your on-screen work really influenced how you help others? Because you've had so many inspirations, and you've had so many opportunities to use your craft. Has that helped you with your roles when you're doing the voiceover, or you know, directing others? I'm a classically trained actress. 
when I was 12, I decided I wanted only to do Shakespeare. And, um, I, I mean, I, I did Two Noble Kinsmen, which was the 38th Shakespeare play into the Folger Library, and, and I'm in the Smithsonian Institute because I did the first uh, uh, play since it was deemed Shakespeare's work before it was Fletcher, Shakespeare, Fletcher, Shakespeare, it's Shakespeare. The Folger <laughs> people decided, so did the first piece at the Globe. So anyhow, I bring all of my background and all of my training as an actress to my directing and to my voice work. It's rare that you get somebody who knows how to direct. Uh, you generally find people who are shy of that. Mm -hmm. So uh, I know how to self-direct, but uh, it all it, it helps me because I I also did improv for 15 years. I was in an improv group, so all of that, and I'm also a singer, and and played piano for many years. So all of that helps with voice work. You have to be musically oriented. You have to, in, in order to hear the musicality of the performances. Um, it would make you hyper aware of like, the cadences of voice based on musicality. And not only that, one of my big deals is that I like to go deep with my characters. As I, I, I'm directing a very, very big series, you'll hear about it next week, I can't say. What's NDA. Called? <laughs> You'll hear about it next okay. week, same as the other. <laughs> um, anyhow, uh, you go, what? But um, it's, it's huge. Anyhow, uh, it's an anime thing. But um, I said to the actor, do not do a cartoony voice. Even though it's a cartoon, we look for truth. And this is a big difference between the way it was done years ago and the way it's done now because we look for truth and authenticity in our characters and the way that they're presented. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that's important for not only the um, fans that you're <clears throat> selling this to, but also for the actors that are playing the parts. You want them to feel like they're a part of the role rather than just being yeah. a funny voice. Exactly. And, and that, that is the way I cast also. I like to bring in people who are actors as opposed to people who come just to it from voice acting because they understand the arc of a character in going deeper. I directed Jade Cocoon many years ago. <laughs> You probably don't even know what that is. It's an amazing, amazing game. I wept while I was doing it. It's such a deep story, and it's glorious because I was able to go so deep. And many of the stories are very, very deep like that, and that's what you get from anime. That's why people go to anime anime. That's why there's 30,000 people at this convention, because people are drawn to the depth and the challenging stories and the philosophical and the science fiction. And it's not superficial. It's not Daffy Duck. It's not Mickey Mouse. It's Dean. So you're very big on the solid writing for female characters in any medium. Have you seen an evolution where fe from then to today where women have been written stronger than before? It's starting. It's starting. I mean, even here in, in West, and this is my panel that's coming up after this, Women in Anime, uh, Legend of Korra. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a great, strong female character. Women are objectified, and this comes from manga, because manga is male fetishism, and uh, it stems from male fetishism, and this stems from the Japanese culture, where the man is superior and the strong, dominant 
gender in the family, and the woman is suppressed and submissive. And But now, women are taking charge, they're marrying later, they're having careers, because they don't want that kind of role model. That's what's happening in Japanese society, and that's reflecting in what's going on today. So there is an evolution. Uh, you even look at Beauty and the Beast. I mean, it's reflected in our stuff, too. What did I grow up with? Cinderella and Sleeping Beauty. Someday my prince will come and I'll be waking with a kiss. You know, we all want to be sexy. We all want to feel pretty. But we want to be taken seriously as human beings. And uh, so that's, that's something I feel very passionately about. And I do this women in anime panel all over the world. I won't be at that panel because we have another interview that overlaps, and I'm sorry. Believe me, it's on my guidebook. But um, speaking of women, and we want to talk about, um, I want to bring up the, the Western, uh, the Suicide Squad, the over sexualization of Harley Quinn. Um, she started as a kind of nonplus character who got sexier and sexier and kind of shoved into mm -hmm. less. Less of a psychic, more into a sexual object. Objectification. Absolutely. Like, do you think that the East is coming up further than, and, and as the West, like, falls back on that? The East is evolving because, as I was saying, women are not wanting to be in a submissive role. They're wanting to take charge of their lives. They want, they're, they're aware of the freedom of the West, mm -hmm. the Western woman. I mean, you look at third world countries where, uh, I mean, it, it's just tragic the way women are treated. Mm -hmm. But, um, I mean, and I, you, you read how, I was just reading this morning about an honor killing of, of a woman in Pakistan, who came home to her family. The family wooed her home. She married a man that the family didn't approve of, and they wooed her home, and the brother and the father orchestrated yeah. to kill her. And, and uh, I mean, we are 50% of this world. 51%. 51% of this world, and as such, we deserve to have equal respect on all accounts. And so the East is evolving, to answer your question, but it has to evolve quicker than it is. I mean, but you look at women and the evolution of women, it was only 96 years ago that we got the right to vote. Exactly. But of course, we all want to be sexy and pretty, but we want to be taken. Men want to be sexy and handsome, but we want to be taken seriously as human beings. But the imbalance is that in anime, men are treated with, with respect and with honesty and truth, whereas... I put that reference, but... Exactly where the women aren't, and the women are objectified, and it's starting to change, but it's it's got a long way to go, and the, and the future of anime is with the people here at the conventions, the writers, the illustrators, because the stories can be great and philosophical and deep, but the illustrators have got to stop objectifying women. And that would be my question, like, where you have, yeah, the objectification of women. I mean, um, I, I, I read a comic um, called Rat Queens that's incredibly feminist. Um, the, the artist, unfortunately, did some very horrible domestic violence, um, and, they, and they dropped him, rightfully so. But my question is, uh, getting back to my, to my previous question, is that, um, the over-sexualization um, of women in Western 
and we have it. We have. I mean, we grew up on on the Playboy magazine, mm -hmm. but it's even more in Japan because in Japan it's so common that children grow up seeing the woman objectified in on television. Nude women are everywhere, and and they're they're objectified. They're, it's not just a woman's form. But it's it's the, the the large breasts, the the large eyes. Do you, uh, uh, women have their eyes changed so that they can look more westernized. I knew a Korean woman who had her eyes made into the shape of silver dollars. They were that round. Wow. I've heard of that. And I I mean, and it's disgusting. And and we have to honor ourselves and and honor who we are. We come in all shapes, colors, and and we're a rainbow coalition of people. And we've got to we've got to respect each other and honor our differences. And I see the value of what you do for it, so I think it's so important that you do these types of panels that talk about women in anime and how to change that mindset. And, and I just have one other thing to say. It's like, when you look at the roles I've played, and I've played a lot of leads, but I'm also a Swiss Army knife, in that I go in and I do I do everything else. Mm -hmm. And they don't say always, what I've done in the thing because they'll put, you know, there's there's two major roles for women, the girlfriend and the friend, and all the rest are men. Yes. And I know this from casting. And and it has to change because this is the reason and and, and, and it's the voices also. You know, you listen to the voices. And all the girls are supposed to talk like this. Hi, my name is Kiwasaka, or whatever her name is. Mm -hmm. uh, but all the girls are expected to have low lead voices, and the men are supposed to have these deep testosterone voices. So we have a way to go, but hopefully it's changing. It just changes one step at a time. Baby steps. Exactly. I'll try to take any offense onto the uh, testosterone voice. It's just my natural voice. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's Sorry, a wonderful, I've just got a deep voice. It's a wonderful voice, but you'll see that the you'll even see the Japanese actors, and they have higher voices because of their body shapes. When they come over here to dub, they want them all to say. They talk. Genre. They talk about um, uh, uh, Johnny. Um, Johnny Bosch talked about like mm -hmm. you know, putting like fingers on your throat to like drop your. Uh, larynx or to squeeze your larynx to have a higher like register if you're doing the well, other version. There, what what I also do is I'll direct the actors just raise your chin. Oh. If you if you raise your voice like this, if you look up, your voice is going to go up. If you look down, your voice is going to go down. The way you position your neck has a uh, lot to do. There's a, a Joe DiMaggio um, voice of Bender. Um, he talked about how he does his um, Tracy Morgan impression. It's just shoving your chin down as far as you can yeah, into your chest. Yeah, yeah. Talking about like, get that weird, you know. Yeah. Um, so there's all kinds of little tricks. Yeah. Or, you know, talking through your nose. Yeah. Mm -hmm. there's Coming all from the diaphragm versus lungs, lungs versus the diaphragm. Right. Nose Head versus voices, mouth. chest mm -hmm. voice, all sorts of things. Well, thanks very much, everybody. I think that's the time we yeah. had booked. But uh, this was great. Thank you, Ellen. That's such, such important Thank topic. Thank you. Too. Yes. I was, uh, I was here listening to your answers about that. Thank you so much. And Thank you. Now I'm off to do my one.